Bet Online is your number one source for all your summer sports this season, from MLB, golf, NBA, and NHL playoff stats. All the latest stats, news, and scores available to follow for your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Believe in OK State podcast. I am Megan Robinson, joined by my lovely co-host, Justin Southwell. And guys, today, another guest, back-to-back weeks with guests. This time it is OSU beat writer for the Oklahoman, Scott Wright. Scott, so excited to have you here to talk about some Oklahoma. Well, Meg, hold on, hold on, hold on. (laughs) UConn legend, Scott Wright. All right, we only invite legends to be guests on this show. And also... My father-in-law's name is Scott, so I can't slip up on your name or I'm in big trouble with the whole family. So, and how tall are you, Scott? Six feet, right on the dot. Right on the dot. Okay. Hashtag blessed. My Scott is six foot seven. So I just wanted to make sure we weren't, I wasn't dealing with like two six feet seven Scott's walking around. Okay. Just wanted to get that out of the way, but glad to have you on the show. (laughs) I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me, y'all. So you have been with the Oklahoman for 18 years, covering Oklahoma State for the last about seven. How did you sort of get into writing and end up on the Oklahoma State beat? You know, it's it's a pretty interesting story because I really didn't know what I wanted to do in college. I was an English major, um, thought about going back and, and being a, a, a teacher and a coach uh, here in UConn, but, um, you know, uh, sort of messed around with some some journalism stuff because I had a, a buddy who was doing journalism and um, I so I was able to take the fun classes and and not have to do all those all those annoying and and difficult ones that everybody else has to do to get a journalism degree uh, so I really kind of enjoyed that and um, started trying to do some um, you know did some like production stuff at a, at a radio station and some TV internships trying to figure out what exactly I might want to do and um, just uh, happened to hear about a um, sports editor position open at the Bethany Tribune right down right down the road from me here and um, went and applied for it got the job I was there for six months uh, got a job out in Shawnee at a daily paper the Bethany Tribune was a was a, a weekly paper so um, I was able to get an actual full-time job out in Shawnee I was there for about three years and um, then then got on at the Oklahoman doing just about anything I uh, you know I, I did high schools for a long time I've done um, the Oklahoma City Yard Dogs, if anybody remembers the, the I remember the arena, Yard Dogs arena oh, football yeah. team. Um, so yeah, I've done a little bit of everything uh, with uh, with the Oklahoman and um, and yeah. So in uh, 2017, we had a, a guy who left late in the in August and uh, middle of August, I guess it was, and they needed somebody and and I was uh, I was sitting there ready, and they gave me a chance. That's awesome, and. Now, now you're in love with America's brightest orange. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm having a blast. There's so many great people uh, up at Oklahoma State to work with that that I do really enjoy my job right now. Well, Scott, the big news coming out of Oklahoma State this week was, of course, the announcement that head wrestling coach John Smith was retiring after 33 years at the helm. He produced five NCAA team championships, 33 individual NCAA champions. 490 dual wins as a coach, 145 All-America honors, 23 team conference championships, 132 individual conference championships, and two Hodge Trophy winners. That is quite the resume. What was your reaction when that announcement hit papers? You know, it was it was interesting because, uh, you know, I was up in Kansas City for for the NCAA championships and um, there wasn't any any real real talk about it. But in the final press conference that that John had up there, it it sort of felt like he was kind of painting the picture a little bit for us. Um, it, just the way that he talked about the future of the program and, um, you know, things that they had overcome that year and um all those sorts of things just made you, you know, more so looking back, I I wasn't in the moment thinking, Oh, this is his farewell press conference. But, but once the announcement came, I started thinking back to those things and it started to really kind of make sense. So, um, you know, there's been kind of some speculation on the outside that, that he might call it quits, you know, sometime here within the last couple of years. Uh, 
but you just you never know with a with a guy like John Smith that's so incredibly competitive. Uh, you don't know what's uh, what drives him and what it, it is that he's looking for, where he wants to leave that program. And so, um, wasn't a total shock um, because you knew it was coming at, at some point. But still, uh, it's it's weird to think about Oklahoma State wrestling with John Smith not being the coach. That's the truth. I mean, he's he's been there as long as I can remember. And, of course, um, for those of you who don't know, I grew up wrestling in Oklahoma. So um, I got I got a quick story to tell about, about John Smith here. Well, it's not quick. Y'all might have to bear with me on this one. So kind of a two-parter, actually. So, of course, I, I actually knew a few guys on the team whenever I was in college because, you know, growing up wrestling in Oklahoma, there was one guy in particular that I knew from Dell city, which is uh, actually the home of John Smith, by the way. So this is 2013. I hear my guy, Tyler Durrell. He's a senior. He's getting the start at 133 pounds. So I'm all in. All right. It's Friday night. So it's not the, the major sellout crowd for what you usually see for Bedlam or Iowa or Penn state or anything like that. But I don't know, there's probably about 1,600 fans in attendance that night, and OSU is set to wrestle uh, West Virginia. This is Big 12 newcomer at the time. And um, I just remember you know, being there for Tyler's match, and then it turned into one of the most incredible matches that I've ever seen. So he's there. I mean, like, score is like scoreless first period. Um, that happens a lot. And then it was like, you know, starts off second period. Um, West Virginia guy gets a takedown uh, back whenever takedowns were only two points. So uh, anyway, um, I'm like, this this isn't good. Okay, so, you know, he's, he's wrestling, fighting back. He ends up getting an escape and everything. Um, West Virginia guy gets another takedown. I think this, this might be in the third period at this point. He gets another takedown. I'm thinking, no, 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 this is it. Like, this is not, this is not good. Like, Came here to support my bro. This West Virginia guy might be too tough. So he's he's still he's fighting back, wrestling. The guy gets hit with some stalling. And then, you know, I'm like, okay, well, like, we'll see how it goes. Like, maybe if Tyler can mix it up a little bit, get another, get another stalling. Of course, gets another stalling, gets the warning. If you get another stalling, it's an extra point. You Tyler gets a point. Uh, that happens again, like 25 seconds later. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, like this is going to go into overtime. Like he literally just all he had to do was, you know, keep driving. He didn't even necessarily have to get a takedown, but he might be able to win this thing in overtime. No, freaking Tyler just goes in, gets a takedown with one second left, and the place, like, it gets so loud. I mean, you guys know Gallagher Iba Arena. It doesn't have to be completely full with 13,000 fans to be really loud. Um, so, yeah, I just remember that being just incredible. So happy for my guy there. But, to John Smith. Okay, this is this is where it gets interesting. All right. So <laughs> I had been to his wrestling camps. You know, I've gotten to talk with him, gotten his autograph on my wrestling camp shirt. I've got his signature shoes. So I'm I'm a big OSU fan, big John Smith fan. And for this particular duel, it was it was unique. I'm sitting alone in the student section, got on my cowboy boots, jeans, and t-shirt, not too far removed from football, so you know biceps are popping and everything but you know i'm just i'm just sitting there chilling watching some wrestling and about halfway through the duel someone comes up to me and asks if i want to be in a drawing to win an academy gift card so i'm like heck yeah well they bring you out onto the mat in front of all of gia to play i, th I think it was like plinko or something like that you know price is right just drop a drop a little chip and see where it lands so you can win like $10, $50, $100 gift card to Academy. I don't know. So I get up, I walk, I walk up to the mat and it hits me. Like I've got my boots on and I'm thinking, is it okay if I step on the mat in my boots? Like it was kind of as a sign of respect, but also for the mat itself. Like I'm not trying to tear it up with my boots. So I'm thinking, I'm about to take my boots off in front of everyone here at Gallagher Arena. And uh, anyway, I, I had the moment of hesitation, but I was just like, ah, I'm, I'll be okay. I'm just going to go with it. So I walk out on the mat, 
look over at Coach Smith, you know, kind of give him a nod, like, hey, Coach, normally I wouldn't walk on the mat with my boots. But this is a unique circumstance. I'm sorry. I love you. Don't hurt me. Uh, you know, I said all that with my, my one nod. And I look over, he's, he's looking at me. And, you know, I have no idea what he's thinking, but I'm like, part of me thinks maybe he recognized me from the wrestling camps. But I had to just imagine, I'm, I'm sure he was thinking like, what is this dude doing walking on my mat in cowboy boots? So anyway, I, uh, I, I won a $50 gift card. OSU won 36 to three that night. And then Coach Smith, uh, he, he let me slide. So, you know, I, I didn't get my butt whooped by Coach John Smith. So for that, I'm appreciative. It was a good night. Doesn't he wear boots and his sweater vests and jeans? That's a good like, point. You know, yeah. Coach Smith. Yes. I think he does sometimes. Very but, much. But he does. But I know the vest. On, the vest is iconic. Yeah. It, it, it absolutely is. And that was one of the coolest touches at the press conference yesterday that uh, so many people uh, affiliated with the wrestling program, uh, all the media relations people all had on vests. So it was, that was really cool. That's awesome. I love, I saw that. I think that you wrote that in your article, mm -hmm. right? Yes, I, and I, I, and I saw the photo of him and Chad and Chad's wearing the vest. And I was like, that is, I just, I love that. And he's in the article, Coleman Scott was like, I was afraid to wear vests Cause that's, that's been coach Smith's yes. thing. I don't want to step on his toes. He is that fashion icon. But yes, if you guys have not read Scott's article on Coach Smith's retirement, please do so on the Oklahoman. Scott, what do you think it was or is about Coach Smith that sets him apart from other wrestlers or coaches? Oh my goodness. I, I, I wish I knew. I wish I could give you a, a great answer to this because there's just there's just so much about him and um you know so much of that press conference yesterday was about his family and it was so cool i i had never had a chance to meet his mom i didn't really get to meet her yesterday but but she was there and i saw her for the for the first time ever and um you know um, i i wrote a story about his dad when his dad passed away a few years ago and so and and obviously you know i've, I've talked to some of his brothers and uh, just the 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 way that that he was raised and the, the the focus that he had on always doing things the right way, um, you know, there was the one story that was told yesterday about about when he was preparing for the Olympics, and um, you know, he said he would he would sneak into GIA at at two a.m. to run because he said it was four p.m. in Russia. He really didn't know what time it was in Russia, but the point was it was the middle of the day over there, and they were training, so he needed to be training too. Um, you know, just the the way the the ability he had to focus on doing everything he needed to do to be the best he could possibly be uh is is phenomenal and then um you know i've, I've got another story that i'm that i'm working on where i've i've I talked to, to harry birdwell the former uh, athletic director from oklahoma state who's um you know out of the uh, out of the athletics game now and is doing some other stuff in oklahoma city and he talked about how incredibly detailed he was in in managing his program everything from you know the things that they had to interact with uh with each other on like budgeting and and things like that um you know down to his his recruiting style and and all of those things and he's just a a meticulous person incredibly competitive incredibly committed to everything he needs to do to be the best at what he's doing and and i think that showed in his wrestling i think that showed in his coaching showed in the way that he maintained the oklahoma state wrestling program over 33 years so um just so much about him that is is just it's it's incomprehensible how talented he is in all the things that he does yeah i just you know i did a 2021, I did a documentary on the um, the history of Oklahoma State wrestling, and we kind of approached it through the coaching eras and the six coaching eras. And when Coach Smith took the job in 1991-92, he was what 23 years old, 24 years old. On you know in 92, he's training for the Olympics as well. So he kind of put his Olympic not hopes aside because he still won a gold medal that year, but he took that job knowing that his, his Olympic goals were going to be harder to reach because he had to put the team first and had to put his training on the back burner. That was the word that I was looking for. And when you talk to coach Smith about this program and he, it's not what he, like, you know, make, he probably could have even gone on to win like in the 96 games and yeah, I don't know, probably yeah, 2000. Like he could have, like, yeah, he could have just kept going. Like that's how good he was. He's 
and I and I will be honest, before I came to Oklahoma State, I was not, I did not follow the sport of wrestling. I did not, I was not like a big wrestling person at all. I did not know the legend that is coach John Smith. But after, you know, talking to his brother Leroy, um, Leroy's wife, Rex Holt, Coach Smith, former wrestlers, like you learn what he means. And then just reading about it, like Oklahoma State is so dominant and he's been here for so much of that dominance. Um, and like people throw around the word goat so freely. If like, oh, we have seven goats, like LeBron's the goat, Michael Jordan's the goat, this person's the goat. Like, no, Coach Smith is legitimately one of, if not the best to ever do it in the sport of wrestling. And I don't know if you guys have seen it, but Oklahoma State Wrestling has been posting little tributes to him through people within the sport and like what Coach Smith means to them. And they're like, he has transformed this sport. Like this sport would not be the same without him. And even Gundy today spoke about like the impact that Coach Smith has had on the sport is, you know, he was dominating for seven years when he was a wrestler at Oklahoma State through the 92 Olympics. And it's just like, I don't know if people who aren't in Stillwater and aren't like hardcore wrestler wrestling followers really understand the impact that he has had on the sport as a whole. It was, it's, it's been one of those things for me where, you know, most of the coaches that, that, that I talk to through my job are, are famous on some level. Um, but when the first time I had to go interview John Smith, I, I couldn't even really comprehend what I was doing. I mean, I, I have a feeling from talking to the two of you here briefly that I'm probably the only one old enough to remember when he was actually wrestling in, in 1990 or 1988. But, um, uh, but I mean, I was 10 years old in 88 when he was, when he was, when he was at the peak of, of his competitive era. And so I remembered that I remember watching him on TV because it was such a big deal that a, a kid from Oklahoma was going to go win a gold medal. And, um, you know, so, so I held him in a, in a very high place as a competitor, even though I hadn't really followed college wrestling all that closely from, from 92 until, until it was probably like November of 2017. The first time I, I went and interviewed him before that season when I got on the OSU beat. So, um, like like going to going to talk to him was almost scary and and then you and then you start interacting with him and and after a match he gets so intense sometimes that it's legitimately scary uh one of my favorite one of my favorite john smith stories was uh, there was a bedlam match uh i want to say it was maybe um i think it was before covid so maybe like um december of 2019 it was it was at ou and it was in McCaslin Fieldhouse, not Lloyd Noble Center. So it's the smaller arena. And they didn't have a spot for us to go do interviews after it was over. And so we're like back in this little hallway, this basically underneath the bleachers. And so it's really tight quarters. And we're standing very close to Coach Smith. And um, OSU had won that day, obviously, because they, I, I don't even know the last time they lost Bedlam. It was like, 10, 12 years ago, something like that. But um, so they had won, but they hadn't performed the way that he wanted them to perform. And he was he was very intense in talking about it. And and at one point, like like you legitimately like just felt like he was gonna like start wrestling you in in the in not, not that he was mad at, at, at me for anything I asked or anybody else. That's just how intense he was when he got started talking about wrestling. And it was um it was it was so interesting to uh, to watch him and and listen to him and I, I i i felt like i knew a decent amount about wrestling even though i'd never competed i had covered it enough by the time i got to uh to interacting with him but i've learned so much about the sport just from getting to talk to him you know a few times a year uh cover after covering them for the last seven years so um just a fascinating guy and um you know over over my entire career there, there, there are only two people that I've ever been in an interview with where I was, uh, where I was legitimately awestruck. I had to get over it with John because 
because I was going to talk to him so many times, I had to be able to, to to function as a reporter and ask him questions and 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 all of those things. But uh, it was him and Tiger Woods. I got to interview Tiger Woods. I actually was oh, just in an interview session with Tiger Woods. I, I didn't ask any questions, but just being there, um, having been a high school golfer uh, in in 1997 when he was emerging, um, that's, awesome. and that's a, a complete side story. But but th between those two guys, I've I've never. I've never been awestruck in in an interview situation well, before. You're doing a you're doing a great job of hiding it in front of Meg because I know. <laughs> but Meg, you mentioned LeBron James, Michael Jordan. I mean, people do consider them goats of basketball. And what's funny is they each have their own shoe. Like people want to get the LeBron, the Michael Jordan shoes. John wrestling, like John Smith has that in wrestling, and his name was like on Dell City High School's gymnasium from the time he was like 20 something, like mid twenties, you know, 26, was, yeah. 26 legend. And it's like, I mean, this guy is the best in the world in an individual sport, which is, it's just him. He can't blame it on anybody else on his team. He is the best. And he was the best for, you know, seven years or whatever it was, but he also carried that, to being a coach and you just listed off all the stuff that he did as a coach just absolutely incredible i wish we had one more year because i know he would have hit that 500 mark I know. I know. but uh 490 i mean you just gotta tip your cap to that he has 150 wins as a wrestler at oklahoma state which is the record which i don't see being broken anytime soon um and then i just i was just pulling up the snippet of gundy's press conference or media availability today. And he was talking about the significance of coach Smith. And he asked a very good question. The debate, he Gundy said, no doubt in my mind, does coach Smith deserve a statue here? If and like, of course he deserves a statue with what he's done. Question is, do you give him a statue as a wrestler or as a coach? What would you guys say? It was really funny hearing Gundy talk about that because his idea was uh, was to do half and half. I'm not sure exactly how that works. Like if you have like like the dress shirt and vest up top, but then like the bottom half of the singlet, uh, that seems like it could get a little yeah. weird. Um, I would I would say I would lean toward toward the uh, the coaching side. Mm -hmm. uh, for one, there is a a statue of him as a wrestler in the Dell City gym. Um, that they built that is really cool, um, but there's a, there's one of those already out there. I think you could do something something really special and unique for him at uh, as in, in uh, uh, more coaching type attire. And no offense to to the Pistol Pete statue there in the in the east lobby of Gallagher Iba, but that's where the statue needs to go because that's where he always came for his interviews. It, it, every you go look at every clip of him doing a, an interview right. midweek, not not after matches, but midweek. He's always standing in front of that statue. That would be the perfect spot for it. I'm laughing because I'm picturing a, you know, 20 foot John Smith statue in place of Pistol P. And I'm like, that would be something. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with you, Scott. I'd probably have to go with the wrestling version because the impact that he had for Oklahoma State as a coach lasted for decades. And you can always point to that and say, you know, he's the greatest Oklahoma state wrestling coach. Tell me more about him. Oh, he was also the greatest Oklahoma state wrestler with 150 wins. So it makes sense. Um, whereas if you just had it as a wrestler, I don't know that you necessarily capture the impact that he had as a coach because he impacted, um, you know, with, with your wrestling career, it's a big deal for yourself, your fans, your family. Um, but then whenever you are a coach, you are impacting lives on that roster for 30 plus years. Like that's, I mean, plus all the fans and plus, you know, everything else. So I, I'd have to lean with coach and get I, obviously the iconic vest. It has to be included in that. And I, I don't think that they would do this, but the, the, the perfect pose for it would be the, the celebratory pose uh, with like his legs spread out and his arms out right oh, after yeah. Nick Piccinini's pin of, of Spencer Lee in the Iowa duel in 2019. That would be perfect. Absolutely. But I, I, I think they'll probably go with something a little more distinguished, a little, a little more reserved. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I think that, I think that they should do that. You know, he's kind of cool. down in a wrestling stance. So, right. Um, 
you wouldn't have to quite make it 20 feet, Meg. You can get down, you can get away with getting, you know, a little bit shorter. Uh-huh. And I'd agree. I agree that it, he should be um, a statue as a coach just because he was that for three decades and the impact is felt. But I would do the coach with the sweater vest. Obviously, you can't do a coach miss statue without the sweater vest. And then maybe put like his Olympic medals around his neck or something, or maybe That's holding an NCAA trophy from when he won the, his NCAA titles, like some way to pay homage, homage, how you pronounce that word, to his time as a wrestler, but also like in coach form. I kind of um, like that. That's that's pretty fun. Maybe you could be like holding on to a sing or not a singlet, a uh, headgear. Here we go. Oh my gosh, guys, right. workshopping, workshopping. We're on to something here. This is that's right. We're, we're on to something. The last question about uh, Coach Smith's retirement announcement, Scott, is Coleman Scott was named the assistant or interim head coach. Uh, Oklahoma law says that the position needs to be posted for five business days before they can hire anybody. Are we expecting that an announcement is imminent that Coleman Scott will be taking over for John Smith? I want to be clear, I haven't gotten any kind of inside information on this. Uh, anybody that knows isn't saying anything right right now, but I fully expect that. I, I think that this was the whole plan when when John decided to bring Coleman Scott back la- uh, you know, uh, last offseason, make him his, his number two man. I, I think this was him putting the pieces in place to get ready to to hand this program over to to Coleman and and I think that's why one of the reasons that that John was so excited about the way things were going this year because he wanted to hand this over not when it was 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 trending downward like it had been the previous two years to have it trending up to have so much young talent um, you know they've still got some veterans that are going to be really important on that on that team as well but so many freshmen and sophomores from last year's team uh, that are that are going to be continuing to develop and then and then new guys coming in the program is is in a perfect place for him to make this transition assuming that's that's what happens yeah i got to agree with that i mean he's got the head coaching experience going to north carolina so that's a big deal um and then obviously his his time people love whenever an Oklahoma state cowboy can return home. So let's bring Coleman Scott back. That's, that's a good deal. And then, you know, he absolutely, if the, if this is the way that it plays out, I think that they absolutely handle it the right way to have that succession plan in place. Um, instead of just leaving the program you know, left wondering what's going on with this, especially like in today's NIL kind of era where you can, and transfer portal, people can bounce around all over the place, but they're maintaining a bit of, you know, consistency, I guess, whenever you're, you're able to say, Hey, we know that coach Smith's not going to be here forever. You come wrestle for the goat for a year or two, but whenever he leaves, you don't need to leave because we got another guy coming in. Who's going to be able to, to take over and, and you're not gonna have to worry about a dip in anything. Like he's going to be able he knows, he knows everything about coach Smith and he can, he can carry the, he can, well, he'll be equipped to take over and leave you in a, in a place where you can have success as well. Our longest tenured coach has called it a career. However, our second longest tenured coach, Mike Gundy, still here. Guys, let's talk some football. Let's talk some football. Third week, fourth week of spring, second to last week yeah, of that's spring right. practice. We're already almost, almost through it. Kind of sad because it means we have a break of football for a while, but then also exciting because football's almost back. <laughs> Scott, you've been there every week. What's your assessment on this team from what you've seen at your limited time at spring practices? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because um, it just it feels so familiar. And I actually wrote this um, the uh, the day the, the, when we got to watch a little bit of the very first practice. It it, it felt like November. Um, you know, we don't get to watch practices in November. So I assume that's what they felt like, but it was just, it was like, you knew everybody. Like I, I, I had a roster. I wasn't having to look at it all that often because I knew all the numbers out there. And that's just so weird, especially it's, it's weird every spring, but you think to where this team was a year ago, you had 28 new guys coming in, all these portal guys, all these, uh, uh, all these recruits coming in at, at semester, it felt like a completely different team from from just a few months before, and and in, in a lot of ways it was. And now it's so familiar, and it's and it just it has to be a very comfortable feeling 
for everybody, you know, even guys like like Brian Nardo going into his second year as, as defensive coordinator, just to have so many guys in place and and being able to to kind of add on to what you've done rather than than feeling like you're starting from scratch in a lot of areas. So um, it's it's just a, a really odd feeling for a spring, but uh, but in a, in a good way for Oklahoma State because it's so familiar. So things are familiar. You brought up Brian Nardo in his second year, our first time in three seasons that we've had consistency at defensive coordinator, which is exciting. However, something I've noticed and something you also wrote about was Kendall Daniels practicing in sort of a hybrid linebacker role. Mm -hmm. Colin Oliver said he looks like a predator out there, posted, saw him in a, a photo of the linebacker group at Brian Nardo's house for a position group dinner. What What's going on with Kendall this season. This is probably by far the the most interesting thing of everything that's happened this spring because it, it is quite a bit different. Um, the main thing is I think Kendall's just outgrown safety. He has he's put on way more weight than they ever anticipated. Listen, I remember I saw I saw him. Um, you know when when basketball state tournaments for the high schools get going, there's so many games going on that all of us it's it's an all skate. Everybody has to go help out. So I was I was helping out uh, when he was in the state tournament for Begs, and I I watched him and, and you could see he's he's six four and that's legit. Uh, but at the time he was like 180 185 pounds and and now I look at him I'm like how is that even the same dude? He's he's easily 230 maybe maybe more than that. And I just I think that he has has just bulked up to the point that that he needs to be closer to the line of scrimmage and, and play in more of a linebacker type of role than than what he can he can do as a safety. Um, you know, it's it's going to be there's going to be challenges for him having to cover some some of these. I mean, if you get him on a on a on a little Brendan Presley size guy in the in the slot, he's going to have trouble doing that. He's just <laughs> he's he's long and rangy, but he's not going to have that type of quickness. So. I think he's I think he's a great fit as a as a linebacker and we'll see how much they actually do it. Um, you know, like you said, hybrid was the word that, that Mike Gundy threw out there. So um, they still want to use him at, in in that middle safety role, which is obviously such an important piece of this Brian Nardo defense. It's kind of the, the, the key that holds everything together in the middle there. Uh, but I think if you you move him into that into that linebacker role with with how physical he is and 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 still the the speed that he has, and understanding coverage that's that's something that that a lot of linebackers don't really fully grasp the way that a, that a guy that's come up as, and been a safety his whole career is going to so i think he can be a real benefit as a linebacker you, you know you slide him into into the spot that was Xavier Benson's last year now you've got Nick Martin and 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 Colin Oliver on the other side uh, that could be a really scary trio of linebackers right there and um you know, I, th I think they're trying to find some ways to to get Colin Oliver more coming off the edge as as a rusher, more so than playing just uh, just more traditional linebacker. And um, so then you bring somebody up like Kendall up there, and and now you've you've got two really good linebackers that can cover a lot of ground, and in, in he and Nick Martin. So I think it gives them a lot of flexibility in this defense, and I think it gives them a lot more ways to attack. I think it could be really fun to watch. Yeah, they need to install some kind of like a like a makeshift Tampa 2 type of coverage where he can play that linebacker spot but also drop into deep coverage if he needs to. Like right. it's it's setting up well for Nardo, you know. He's just he's inherited this defense and of course he wanted to do the 335, but you might have to mix it up a little bit just based on the personnel of what you've got um, based on the previous recruiting group and everything. Just use the the talent that you have to your advantage and, and make it work for those guys. Um, but of course, at the same time, recruit for what you intend to have in the future. So it's uh, maybe a bit of an adjustment for him, but I think that he's doing a great job adapting from what I hear. Yeah, and that that I think is probably the most important thing about this from from the Brian Nardo perspective is that he is adjusting to his personnel. Um, you know, he's looking at it and saying, you know, we didn't get enough pass rush last year. Colin Oliver is our best pass rusher. We've got to f find ways to make him more impactful in that role more frequently. Um, you know, we've got Kendall Daniels who could who could come up and be a, and be a, a beast closer to to the line of scrimmage. He's making these moves that are fitting ideally with the talent that he's got. And 
I think that says a lot about uh, about him. A lot of a lot of defensive coordinators aren't always willing to do that. Some guys are saying this is the defense we run, and it's the defense we're going to continue to run. So, uh, yeah. and they and they sometimes will try to to fit a square peg into a round hole, and he's not doing that. He's he's a, adjusting his scheme to fit the talent that he's got to to take the best advantage of, of what they can do. And I think that's um, you know I think that's a really important piece of what we're learning and still learning about, about Brian Nardo as a coach. Sticking with the defense, you know, you look at the, if, if Kendall plays this sort of hybrid safety linebacker role, that's one less experienced DB and our DB specifically corners struggled a little bit last season. So what have you seen about the depth? at the cornerback position specifically. Yeah, um, the, the secondary as a whole has, uh, they got a lot of young guys, some some action, but most of that was at safety. And so um, you look at, at what they had at corner and um, you know they brought everybody back. Corey Black decided to stick around for his super senior year, which um, was something that didn't get a lot of publicity over the winter because I don't think he, he really you know made any kind of announcement. He just just didn't leave. Um, so, so it didn't get a bunch of pub, but I think that's one of the most important decisions uh, that, that anybody made on as in terms of coming back for a super senior year. Uh, so then that he can really kind of anchor one side at corner. And so then you can, then you can try to find the guys that fit on that other side. And um, you know, Cam Smith is a guy that, that a couple of years ago sort of got forced into action in uh, some, you know, injury situation. He went into uh, the Texas tech game. He was the the number three cornerback and, and uh, Corey gets hurt. Then uh, DeMarco Jones gets hurt. And all of a sudden he's your guy. And he really grew from that situation. And um, you know, didn't, didn't, wasn't really a regular starter, but played quite a bit that year and, and really developed. And then Kale Smith, um, not Corey, not, uh, not Cam's brother, Cam's brother's in the other spot, but uh, all the Smiths, in the secondary can get confusing, but Kale Smith from Midwest City uh, was a guy last year that that got some uh, some extra run and and really showed that he's maybe ready to take another step. So between those two guys, um, Kenneth Harris is a guy that that no not a lot of people are talking about, but I'm still curious about. Transferred from Arkansas State, where he had a really good career, had like nine interceptions in his in his career. Um, redshirted last year, and I thought he might be a guy that could could maybe add some depth there. Haven't heard a lot of talk about him, um, but we'll see if if he's able to come in and maybe be that fourth guy that uh, that helps let them uh, kind of rotate and get some guys some rest from time to time. So I, I, I think they have a chance to to take a step forward at corner, but it's uh, it's it's still going to be a lot of pressure on whoever's opposite Corey Black because quarterbacks are going to try to avoid him as much as they can. Yeah, I talked to Kale last week, Kale Smith, and sweetest kid, just the absolute nicest kid. And it's weird because he's in his fourth season, but he's a redshirt sophomore because he medical redshirted his first year, redshirted his second year, played in all 14 games, Justin, on special teams and defense. We talked about the importance of special teams last week. Well, there's a special teamer for you. And now this year, I feel like he's really ready. He's, you know, he's an upperclassman has a year of playing under his belt, has that experience. And he stopped playing football up until his junior year of high school and got back into it because he wanted to pursue basketball. And they're like, that's not going to work out for you. Got back into football and got a D1 offer at Oklahoma State. Like, okay, you know, like that's just athlete, athlete right there. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, that was one of the things that when I was when I was on the high school beat, uh, that was always so fascinating to to watch because there are a lot of guys like him that want to be basketball players and, um, you know, the opportunities. And I understand football is not for everybody, but the opportunities in football are, are so much more significant that, uh, you know, if you're if you're willing to do it, um, I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of guys that that are six one and and can run up and down the basketball court but if you can get out and and, and cover a guy you can have a, a real opportunity on the football field that's kind of cool too like, that you mentioned that I, I mean most of the guys that that get injured in football it's almost like you have to have such a love and passion for the game to be able to bounce yeah. back from injury and have resilience and you think like a guy that really preferred basketball over football I mean, typically that's the person that's going to say, I'm just going to hang up the cleats. You know, it's not worth it for me. Coach Glass's workouts are too hard. Like, I, what am I doing here? But the fact that he's like, man, I'm going to stick with it. 
that's pretty awesome. I, I think it's also, he's a first gen student and part of the reason he accepted, he got offered Oklahoma state, he, Oklahoma state. I think he also said he got offered from Oregon state. And those were like the two big power five programs that offered him. And he wanted to stay close to home from Midwest city. Um, and so he accepted Oklahoma state. Cause it was also during COVID. He's like, I'm going to accept this because this is a sure thing. And I think that but to your point also, Justin, yeah, he loves the sport, but I think that also being on the football team is a way to stay in college and have that scholarship and have it pay for. So, you know, he's a, um, he's a business major. He wants to open his own fashion business after football ends, whenever that may be, whether it's after college or after the NFL. He's like, yeah, I want to own my own businesses. I want to be my own boss. So I think that he also sees the bigger picture and sees that football, I don't want to say as a means to an end, but can take him far in multiple aspects of, okay, I can get a free education. I can have a backup plan or, you know, once my career ends, here's my plan for my career. And that's something I really admire about Kale Smith, because again, he's first gen. So he doesn't know what he doesn't know about college and for him to stick with it. And, um, you know, from where he came from to here, it's just, I, I want good things for him because he's such a nice kid and he works so hard and he himself said that he's grown so much from his freshman year to now, and he loves coach Duffy. Uh, so hopefully that room just steps it up. No, they had a bad season last year, but just overall, hopefully they step it up a little bit and whoever plays opposite Corey can also lock down. Yeah. Well, I mean, like we, we even kind of touched on it earlier talking about, you know, Nardo making adjustments and stuff. The the guys in the secondary, it's not that they're bad. It's just that, you know, some of that might've just been due to a lack of getting pressure on the quarterback up front. So if the, if the defensive line and linebackers are able to scheme ways to get more pressure on the quarterbacks, the guys in the secondary are going to be able to have a lot more success. So. Scott, last season, obviously, Ollie Gordon, Doak Walker winner, breakout year. I personally, I have been fangirling over Nick Martin since uh, last summer because he also kind of came out of nowhere. Who is a player or who are some players that fans should look out for this season that could have a breakout year? You know, this guy, this guy's a true freshman. Uh, obviously, he was he was in high school just a few months ago. So I, I don't want to put the expectations too high. So it might be another year away. But the amount of buzz and the excitement that Josh Ford has created, the Stillwater tight end, a lot of people are talking about him. We uh, Colin Clay started talking about Colin Clay doesn't doesn't line up opposite a tight end ever. He's in the middle of the defensive line, uh, but he said in watching film, he keeps seeing this kid make plays. Physically, he hasn't had any issue making the transition from from high school to college. Everybody has raved about what he's been able to do when he gets on the field. You know, obviously they've got they've got Tyler Foster, the Ohio transfer, who's a super senior and much more experienced, and and probably going to be the number one guy at tight end. But I, I think Josh Ford is going to force his way onto the field, and obviously tight ends aren't going to have crazy numbers the way that that Ollie or or Nick did at, at their positions. Um, so you know, it's it's hard to get uh, to get crazy excited about what he might do, but just the amount of talk that there has been about him has been really fascinating this, this spring. And then, um, you know, I don't know if Dejan Stribling qualifies for, for, for this, but I'll take it. Uh, I mean, I really think, I, I think he's a guy that, that is going to be uh, going to be able to put up the type of numbers uh, that's, that's going to put him way up in, uh, in, in, respect and 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 the way he's viewed as an Oklahoma State Cowboy um, you know I think he was he was ready to have that breakout year last season then obviously broke his wrist and 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 derailed everything but I just I think he's got NFL talent and NFL body and I really see a a high ceiling for him now the tough part is going to be that this receiver group is 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 more developed. Last year, it was they needed somebody on the outside to take some attention away from Brennan Presley, um, but now they've got they've got Rashad Owens on the other side. Obviously, Brennan's going to get his catches because because he's such a superstar when he has the ball in his hands. So they're going to be they're going to be battling for for opportunities to do anything with the ball between um, Owens and and Presley and and Stribling, plus the other young guys that are going to try to fight their way in there. So it's going to be tricky, but I really think he's going to have a special season. Yeah, we'll have to bookmark what you said about Ford because one, you said freshman, and two, you said tight end. Like, 
It's going right. to be a minute, I think. You know, it it, um, yeah, it, it absolutely is. But, but uh, I'll say I'll say this between he and yeah. and and defensive lineman Armstrong Notum, the way that people are talking about those two guys physically as as true freshmen who are enrolling early, uh, it, it gives you reason to get really excited about those two dudes. Yeah, that's awesome. And like what you said about Strib, same thing. Like I I agree. Like there's there are so many guys at receiver but we definitely we need that depth and i feel like it can be challenging for for the players themselves and maybe even for the fans where if it if they don't go off for 150 yards 100 yards in the first game or second game and it's like what well what are we doing we're not you know we're not getting the ball one those are the games where we're not opening up the playbook so have some patience and two just give it time like it's a it's a long season so these guys, I believe, are we're potentially looking at two, maybe three receivers who can reach around a thousand yards, maybe more. But also keep in mind, you're going to be running Ollie Gordon as well. So there's only so much to go around. But I think that as long as these guys are all, you know, competing and loving it with each other to be able to have success. You can't go wrong. So we need again that depth because there was there were a few times, Scott, last year we we're thinking, what's what's gonna happen? Like Stribling just went down and then you know Rashad Owens comes up, but he wasn't on the radar for a while. So um it's it's just nice to know that we have guys that can to step into that spot and to play at a high level. Yeah, yeah. Talking about the depth, I mean, I remember being, you know, at some of the road games in particular where you're limited how many guys you can take. They would have like like maybe just five receivers, and one of them would be like one of the true freshmen, like Tyke Andrews or Cameron Hurd or or, or Jalen Pope last year. Uh, so they were really at, at at four receivers that they that they felt like they could really count on because those guys hadn't proven anything yet. So um, now to have some some depth built up and have some guys that you're excited about, um, you've got the, another transfer portal kid coming in in the in the summer that that could be able to help as well. So. Um, to have a little bit of depth in that in that receiver room is really valuable. Scott, we love to do way too early predictions on this show because why not? Uh, who are you taking? You're and you're less biased than Justin and myself because I work for the university and Justin is an alum. You you know, guys. But no I also you. just spit facts, so <laughs> it's not bias. You know, I was saying I was saying ten wins for sure last year, and look what happened. So hey. Bias aside, spitting facts. Fair, but you know, no cheering in the press box. Number one rule of being a journalist, Scott. In your completely unbiased opinion, who are you taking for the Big Twelve championship in your way too early prediction for twenty twenty four? Oh man, um, I, thought, I was I was hoping I was getting like a win total que question. Or okay, something. we can do win total, and then who are you taking? We will do. Both. Well, here's the here's the thing. I I think you've got to consider Oklahoma State in the mix right off the top. For, for for that for that title um you know I like I've, I've looked at some of the the Vegas projections whether it's been um you know the big 12 uh championship odds or uh projected win totals I, I think I think like seven and a half wins and and they were like the eighth team in line in in big 12 odds I don't I don't understand it at all um uh, when you look at the at what they just did, and all the dudes they got back. It does. I. I can't. I, I mean, I don't understand Vegas. I'm horrible at at, at, at gambling on 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 sports. Um, but so maybe they see something that I don't. I just don't get it. I really think it's going to come down to um, Oklahoma State, Utah, and Kansas State. I think are 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 the top three. I think they're the three best teams in this league. And so uh, we'll see. But because of experience at quarterback and i understand that alan bowman is a, a little bit of a polarizing figure because because some some fans do want to see um you know somebody that's that maybe has more arm talent or can move around a little bit better or all of those things but i think there's a lot of value in his experience his knowledge and all of those things so i i think that um is yeah that gives oklahoma state an edge coming down the stretch because of of his understanding of how to to move an offense with all the talent that he's got around him. Uh, so Scott, do you think that he has to play at an elite level for them to win a championship? Or do you think it can be more of what we saw last year and they can maybe get by with competing for a championship, but 
I think I, I think he can if he can be um, you know the guy that that you saw sort of through um, through most of October. Um, you know, I think that's, uh, I think that guy can lead them to a big 12 championship. And if you win the big 12 championship, you're, uh, you're in the playoff and, uh, and who knows what can happen from there. So yeah, I, I don't think he has to suddenly become a guy that goes and throws for 5,000 yards. Uh, you know, but I think, I think if, if you get, um, you know, that, that, that chunk of the middle of the season where, where the offense was really humming and obviously Ollie Gordon mm-hmm. had a lot to do with that, uh, right, but right. If you if you get that guy, uh, I think you've got a chance to uh, to have a really special season. He doesn't have to be he doesn't have to be elite. He's got to be really solid, really consistent. Uh, you know, he, he, nine of his interceptions came in the last uh, five or six games. I can't remember. I haven't looked at the stats in a while, mm-hmm. but um, you know, it, you cut down the turnovers and and he was a guy that did not throw a lot of interceptions during his career at Texas tech and they were throwing the ball all over the place. So uh, I think that's something that was a little bit of, of an anomaly in his, in his numbers last year. Uh, so I think the, I think the interceptions will come down and I think that he's going to be uh, uh, even more reliable than he was last fall. So also, I mean, I don't really want to talk about them, but Iowa state, they have a lot of returning guys. So where are they on your radar? Are they sitting around the four or five range in your, yeah. in your rankings there? Yeah, I would th- I would throw uh, them in Kansas. Probably Kansas is a little bit of a wild card because you right. just, you don't know for sure. Um, and then and then Arizona, I think, is probably right there in that mix as well. Actually, I'd probably put them at the top of that group. Okay. Um, yeah. But we'll see we'll see what happens with with the coaching change. Obviously, that could um, that could shake things up there. So um, you know, but I think I think that's uh, the majority of that group. I'm trying to think if I'm leaving anybody out out of. Uh, uh, other teams that I see in the in the top half of the league, but that's those are the ones you know, that some really some people try to slide Texas Tech up there. Are they yeah, doing anything for I'm you? Gonna to, I'm gonna have to see it before I believe it with Texas Tech. I I mean mm-hmm. I think that uh, I think that Joey McGuire is gonna get them going. I just I don't know. Um, last year didn't do a lot for me to to really see it happening this year. And we can't forget about you know TCU that just played for a national championship a couple of seasons <laughs> right. ago. <laughs> that's that's what's so crazy about this league like like tcu played for for a national title uh, uh you know a little over a year ago and yeah. uh and and now we're hardly even talking about them in at the top of the conference baylor was was in the in the title game in, in 2021 against oklahoma state and have completely fallen off the map this 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 league is going to be so much fun um you know like the the competitiveness of this league there's there's just never going to be a, an off week i'm i'm really excited from from my perspective as as someone whose job it is to just tell people what happened i'm really <laughs> looking forward to 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 big 12 play it's going to be spectacular yeah well guys seven and a half months until the big 12 championship in football but this weekend but you're fired up now so. we're fired up now but if you want some big 12 championship action come to stillwater this weekend because tennis mm-hmm. is hosting the big 12 championships men are the five seed the women number one overall seed first ever time they went undefeated in the regular season earning the regular season big 12 title a little nervous about texas at two that's you know if if the brackets line up how they're expected to we could be facing texas in a final we've beat them twice already this season but as we all know hard to beat a team three times so if you want some big 12 championship action come to the michael and Ann, or michael and ann greenwood tennis center this weekend and support your cowboys and cowgirls yeah i'm i'm really looking forward to this entire postseason with this with this women's team yes. um you know, because I, I, you know, I've, I've covered softball pretty much my entire uh, time at the Oklahoma, um, not Oklahoma State softball, but college softball in general, because the the World Series obviously being in Oklahoma City is such a big deal, um, and and that that it's been fun to watch that program grow under, under Kenny Gajewski. Uh, obviously, the equestrian program has had has had a lot of success, but that 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 carrot of the first female NCAA championship is dangling out there and they have a chance to do it. They don't have to leave Stillwater. They can win a big 12 title regional supers and, uh, and then the NCAA championships in Stillwater. It's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun to follow that program the next uh, month. And no, uh, gosh, a little over a month, I guess, but yeah, it's going to be fun. I went Sunday. I went, my mom was in town this weekend and we went to the, the K state match 
um, on Sunday. And it was my first time going to an Oklahoma State tennis match. And I'm so bummed that that was my first one because they're so fun. They're so fun. And it's fun when you win. So it's even better when you're dominating. <laughs> Well, Scott, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, we could probably stay here another few hours talking Oklahoma State sports, but I'm sure you have more important things to do, like spend time with your family because um, you came right from spring practice to be on this podcast. So we greatly appreciate it. But we'd love to have you on maybe again when it gets closer to the season and, you know, or even even midseason. We can see, you know, how how Ford is doing and how some of your predictions are holding up. <laughs> There you go. Sounds good to me. Thanks for having me, y'all. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate you. Well, on behalf of Justin, I'm Meg. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Believe in OK State podcast presented by Bet Online. Like, share, subscribe, follow, rate, review, and of course, go Pokes. Go Pokes. <laughs>